Okay, great. Um, well, hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for Propagating Plants During the Pandemic, which is delivered by the nonprofit Paradise Gardeners. I um, really wanna thank um, the president, Nancy, and also the treasurer, Kim, for um, allowing us to host this event. Um, my name is Azalea Ebai, and I'm the branch manager at the Skyline Hills Library at San Diego Public Library. Um, before we start, we just have one housekeeping rule. We ask that you keep your video turned off and your mics muted during the presentation, um, just so that we can focus on the presenters. Um, during the question and answer um, segment, feel free to type in your question in the chat box and the presenter will answer them in the order that they're received. Um, the paradise... So this is Kim. I think that um, Amy said she's willing to take questions as we're going along. Oh, awesome. I'll be, monitoring, I'll be monitoring the chat. So if anybody has questions, go ahead and type them in as they come up and I'll go ahead and forward them to Amy. Oh, thank you, Kim. Thank you. Um, the Paradise Gardeners are a local nonprofit that contributes to the community by planting trees, making improvements, and providing home gardening education. Um, their usual meeting will take place right after this program in another Zoom link. Um, joining us today, we have Library Assistant Destiny Rivera, who is the lead organizer of the Ocean Beach Seed Library, and Amy Huey, who is watershed caretaker at the Sweetwater Authority and adjunct faculty at Cuyamaca College. So without um, further ado, um, we'll get started. Um, thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, just hop on, hop right on in. Um, my name is Destiny Rivera. I'm a library assistant at the Ocean Beach Branch Library. Um, thank you so much, Azalea, for inviting me to give a brief introduction of the Ocean Beach Seed Library. Um, I recognize Kim's name from, you know, a few years back, um, kind of observing some of your presentations at Skyline. So um, yeah, thank you for your work too. And um, I'm happy to hear the presentation. Um, just to keep things really brief, um, I just wanted to uh, invite and uh, share some information about the Ocean Beach Seed Library in case um, anyone isn't familiar with it. Um, we do have a few um, Actually, if I can just give a brief introduction to what a seed library is, uh, that might be a good place to start. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so essentially a seed library is, it's very simple um, in how it works. The idea is that uh, people can borrow seeds um, to then return them back into the seed library collection. So in this uh, brief, um, uh, PowerPoint slide, um, we see that the first step is to borrow the seed. So in this picture, we see people are checking out a tomato plant. Um, the idea is that you take that seed home, you grow it, and then you save the seed from that plant to then bring back to the library. Um, so why this is really special is that you get some really locally adapted seeds. Um, so in Ocean Beach, we're notorious for having a marine layer that's kind of you know, always there in our neighborhood. Um, so when people, I think there's about 80 gardens, 80 home gardens in OB that have checked out Ocean Beach Seed Library seeds, um, which is really phenomenal. We, I didn't, I wasn't aware of how many, you know, home gardens there were in our town. Um, so the advantage of when people check out our seeds and then return them is that their neighbors can then check out that second generation tomato seed that, um, you know, it might have better luck growing in our climates, our microclimates. Um, so that's the advantage of having a seed library in your neighborhood and in your town is that you get the most, um, you know, genetically adaptive varieties. Um, and a seed library is also an educational institution. So we're able to offer programs and, um, you know, both in the library and outside of the library. So if we don't mind going to the next slide. Um, this is just a, a picture of our um, Ocean Beach Seed Library. Um, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we our Ocean Beach branch is closed as our um, most public libraries at this point, or, um, you know, branches, they're open for limited services. 
Um, but how we've adapted to the pandemic is we have a seed library by mail uh, program. So that's really what I'm here to share today is that um, anyone who's interested, um, we have a, a Google form that you just fill out uh, online. You fill out the Google form and we're happy to ship out seeds to you. Um, thank you, Azalea. Um, there's a link in the chat to this Google form um, and it lists the we have so many varieties of seeds, so it lists um, if you to the form that um, you can then order and request seeds through. Um, if you also would want to donate seeds back into the seed library, um, we can, um, you can feel free to email me and I can give you instructions for those seed donations. Um, and if we could go to the last slide, um, or is this the last slide? Oh, okay. So this was just um, a reiteration of our seed library by mail service or our, our seed libraries during COVID-19 have the seed library by mail program. Um, we're also, we just uh, finished offering a few programs on seed starting, composting and soil science. Um, we're also advocating the link in the chat. Um, um, I'd encourage you all to join our Facebook group. Um, we have a pretty large uh, membership group and um, we kind of share these and um, any latest events that we have, um, you can find on the Ocean Beach Seed Library uh, Facebook. And so our, our job right now is to really uh, pandemic uh, gardening, just like this workshop is focused on, you know, how, how can we encourage sustainability um, in and through this pandemic. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any questions and thanks again for letting me do this little intro. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much, Destiny. I, I saw someone asked um, what was the big, or was the difference between the Ocean Beach and the Scripps Ranch Seed Libraries? Yeah, so they're essentially the same uh, program. We're happy to now have two branches of seed libraries within the San Diego Public Library. Um, they're kind of, um, they're individually organized. So, you know, Ocean Beach staff organizes Ocean Beach Seed Library and Scripps Ranch uh, staff organize that. Um, but essentially, um, uh, we're in communication with each other. So we're just two, two different branches within San Diego Public Library. So, yeah, feel free to utilize whichever one is, is more convenient for you. Another quick question, do people have to return the same type of seed that they borrowed? That's a great question. Um, you, we accept a variety of donations, so you don't have to return, you know, exactly the seed that you're checking out. Um, it's just part of the learning process. If you want to um, see this, the plant grow from start to finish, finish um, we do encourage that, you know, like witnessing the full life cycle of a plant. Um, but we accept all sorts of seed donations. Yeah. And question, is it available in county libraries? Not that I'm aware of. Destiny, do you know of any county libraries doing this? I think um, there, I don't believe that there are any seed library programs in the county. I think Chula Vista, um, mm -hmm. there's a, I think one of the Chula Vista libraries does have a seed library branch. And also, but as of, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, as of, um, from what I know, it's mostly the, the two branches at San Diego Public Library and the Chula Vista branch. Just a quick note on the slide that's on the screen. Actually, this should have been at the end. Uh, at the very end of this uh, presentation, the Paradise Gardeners will be going into a business meeting. And that's what that little black box is on that slide. It's not happening right now. <laughs> but at the end of our presentation, we'll be going into a business meeting that has a separate link. So if you see that on your screen, don't panic. This is the meeting you should be in. That makes more sense. <laughs> thank you so much, Destiny. And thank you, Kim. Thank you, Destiny. You're welcome. And I went ahead and attached the Facebook group uh, right in the chat. Sending that now. Perfect. Oh, awesome. And next up, Under we have Amy Huey. Thank you. Um, what a wonderful idea and how exciting. We'll talk a little bit more about seeds and how you can collect and store those during this talk. 
And it sounds like there's a lot of really great opportunities to learn even more, go in depth on some of these subjects through that program. So that's exciting. Uh, my name is Amy Huey. I'm a director of Paradise Gardeners. If at any point in this presentation you can't hear me or my neighbor startup power equipment, let me know and I can run inside. <laughs> um, and my background, I studied nursery technology at Cuyamaca College in the Ornamental Horticulture Department many years ago. I currently am um, the plant propagation co-chair along with Tori Neal for the California Native Plant Society San Diego chapter. And we have a meeting space at City Farmer Nursery, City Farmers Nursery and Bill Tall, Farmer Bill lets us work over there. It's a wonderful program. We can't work in person right now. You're going to hear this throughout the presentation um, due to COVID, <laughs> but we do have some online Zoom meetings. I will be teaching plant propagation this spring semester at Cuyamaca College. There are still a few spots available in that class. And the wonderful thing so far, I haven't heard differently, lectures will be online, but labs will be in person, socially distanced. So let's hope that I, I haven't heard any different. So that's what I'm going with. Um, one of the few opportunities right now. And I do have a full-time job as a watershed caretaker for Sweetwater Authority. I worked in habitat conservation, restoration type field for several years. Um, I'd like to tell you about Paradise Gardeners. It's a new garden club that was officially formed in 2019. The folks were working on some of these projects ahead of that. And it's the first garden club in District 4, a very diverse district in San Diego, the city of San Diego. Um, we have been providing high quality presentations, uh, programs like this that are free at the Skyline Hills Branch Library, which is our home when we can go in there. But as you know, COVID, we're meeting online these days and we're still providing really high quality programs that are free. So um, there'll be some more links at the end of the presentation. We, since we've started, um, you can see the mural in this slide. We've done a lot of beautification and uh, environmental projects to uh, educate the public and make things pretty out there. We, we have done this mural. There will be a tree planting going in. This is on Paradise Valley Road and there'll be a tree, there'll be trees planted along there. We've done uh, cleanup efforts to tie into all of that and um, one of the really exciting things that we're doing is there is a covered former landfill on Potomac and Paradise Valley Road that we are installing a native plant garden in. And we, along with that effort, we are looking for volunteers. We're looking for contributions. We love the enthusiasm and we can't wait to be back in person, able to work on that. Earlier in COVID, when the restrictions weren't quite as stringent, we did get phase one and phase two work started on that project and have done a lot of planted Engelman oaks and mulched and did the cardboard uh, mulching. So there's a lot going on there. We can't wait to get going again. We'd love to meet you in person and not over Zoom, though it's nice that we have this option. So please email and this will be at the end. You'll be able to see it spelled out, but paradisegardenerssd at gmail.com is a way to get in touch with us and find out about all those opportunities. So it's a really fun garden club and we've got big plans and we're doing a lot of really good things. So propagating during the pandemic. You can still propagate during the pandemic. <laughs> the logistics can be a little bit different and we're not going to be meeting in big groups like this without masks. Um, it's really fun to meet other people who are excited about plants. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but they're some of the best people around, plant people. I just adore being around them and hearing what they're excited about and their infinite varieties of things you can focus in on and uh, the knowledge that you share. It's, it's a lot of fun. We're stepping back a little bit so that we can stay healthy and come back together again in the future. Um, the, 
nursery industry, the horticulture industry, it's really done well during the pandemic. Some people have found that they have time that they didn't expect to have, and they're doing projects around the home and planting. Um, as Destiny mentioned, people are more interested in food security. And um, I hear a lot of people talking about food sovereignty. And so there's a real interest. And a lot of our nurseries are open. Some of their hours have changed. I know City Farmers is in person some days. It's drive through with your and open your trunk and they'll load it up for you other days. Um, and then there's a lot of little little nurseries nearby that you can go visit. <clears throat> Many of them are still in operation during COVID. So why should you propagate your own plants? It can be less expensive. It can be expensive to get set up if you're trying to build a greenhouse on your property. But there's a lot of um, low tech ways to do propagation at home that aren't super expensive. A lot of the box stores can produce plants at a really cheap price, but um, then you're getting kind of the run of the mill plants. So when you do it at home on your own, you can do heirlooms, you can do interesting cultivars uh, that may not have even made the nursery scene. And it gives you a lot of flexibility and it's really fun. Um, it can also be frustrating because you are going to have failures along the way but it can be really fun. Stick with it, give yourself a little bit of break. I know all of us hate it when we lose plants, but we're going to with propagation, it's inevitable. <clears throat> the more you stick around, the more tricks you learn, you can figure out some ways to have increased success and we can learn from each other. You get new baby plants and they're really cute. And often when you propagate, you get more baby plants than you can use. And so you can share them with your friends. I really like doing that. I like getting plants shared from friends. And with propagation, plant propagation, we've got two major categories that I want you to think about because they have some really distinct advantages and disadvantages. So there's sexual and there is asexual or vegetative propagation, and we'll talk more about that. <clears throat> this is a mist chamber. Jim Wadman standing there was the propagation chair and he built this. It emits very fine mist over seeds and cuttings and it keeps it with the, in a nice humid environment. And I think he, he repurposed that corrugated plastic for insulation and to cut down on the, the light there. So we have this at City Farmers Nursery that we use to get things started. This is kind of medium tech. You don't have to, you don't have to even get to that level. Um, this is the previous propagation mist room at Cuyamaca College up top and uh, had bottom heat on the outside. It had misters that are intermittent and uh, fans and all of that. You can get higher tech like that and you don't have to. <laughs> you can do it at home even without these things. Even without the irrigation, you can hand water. <clears throat> you just have to be on top of it. So if I get to talking too fast at any point, let me know. But um, I noticed I'm, I'm excited to get through a lot of material. Uh, seeds are how we typically do sexual propagation. And sexual propagation means there's a recombining of the genetics. So we don't always know what we're going to get unless some seed companies with hybrid seeds and those do controlled breeding. So they know exactly what they're going to get out of those genes. But when we're out in our yard picking seeds off of plants, we are getting a new mix of genes and we don't know what we're getting and there's, there's a range in there. So it's exciting. Uh, it's very inexpensive to use seeds for propagation. You can store seeds really easily. You can get a lot of seeds in a very small area. A seed packet can have hundreds or thousands of seeds and you can, you can have tons in a small space. We get that genetic diversity, like I said, with the sexual um, recombination of genes. And so we get lots of adorable little babies at a really low cost. And we don't have to have this fancy equipment. So don't think you're out of the game because you don't have a greenhouse. That, 
That's not the way it works. So what's in a seed? I think that I used to think of these as inanimate objects that, that were just inanimate, <laughs> but they are alive. They are metabolizing in there. There are processes going on. So a seed has a coat for protection. It's got some potentially, not all seeds do, but some nutrition, nutritive tissue in there. And then it has an embryo. So it has the, it has a little living thing in there that's ready to go with the, the root area that's going to sprout out, the shoot area. And uh, so we have to take the care of seeds because they are little living things. Don't, don't forget that fact when you're storing seeds and such, that'll help you along. So this is Selene stenophylla. It was found in the Siberian permafrost. It is, it's been dated to 32,000 years old and it grew from seed that was found in frozen conditions. You can dry seeds down and freeze them and store them for a really long time. We are probably by and large not set up to do that at our houses. One thing that you can do though is make sure your seeds are dry, make sure they're in a dry package and chuck them in the fridge. And if your family is accommodating, they'll give you one of the crisper drawers down below and that's where you get to keep your box of seeds, which is what I do. Um, that'll slow down the metabolism and it'll help your seeds last longer. So seeds can die inside and when you go to sow them, you're not going to get success from them. But if you pull them down, you can make them last a little bit longer. So this is probably, this is one of the videos. I'm gonna have to stop sharing, share on YouTube and then come back. So if I lose you guys anywhere along that line, you need to let me know. But there are some really important classifications for the purposes of collecting, processing, and storing the seeds that you're interested in. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you dehiscent. These ones break apart. Um, they often fling their seeds all over the place. And it's a strategy that they use so that they can um, get those new little babies spread out around. I'm gonna leave the sound on and hope you can hear it. So these seeds will dry out, the outside tissue will twist and it'll fling those seeds. And that's a strategy that they use to get those seeds away from the parent plant and spreading across the, the land. Okay. Am I back on my PowerPoint? Are you with me on my PowerPoint here? Yes. Excellent. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Indehiscent, these ones. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to say about dehiscent, like California poppies, they'll fling their seeds all over the place and you have to go out there and look every day to see if they're getting ready to explode everywhere and fling seeds. If you want to collect the seeds, you can actually take that seed pod a little bit early when it's green still, starting to turn brown and hasn't flung open. And then you can put it in a kind of dry place that's covered and let it dry out and it may fly open. It'll finish maturing and those seeds can be viable. So sometimes a strategy like that with something that thrown at seeds all over the place can help you to collect the seeds. Indehiscent, these are so cooperative. They hang on to their seeds. A lot of our grains have been bred so that the part we're interested in doesn't shatter off of the plant. Uh, really easy to collect. You don't have to be out, out there every day checking on it. You can, ah, I've got the weekend off, I'll head out there and, uh, and I'll uh, go collect some seeds. Kind of your timeline more than uh, the dehiscent ones. Fleshy, you wanna collect those after they're ripe, but you wanna get rid of that fleshy material when you store them because that's uh, nutrient rich. And a problem that we have with propagation, big, big problem is pathogens and fungus and all those kinds of things that will compete and kill our seeds off. 
So fleshy, we're gonna process those before we put them in a seed envelope. I'll ah, see now it wants to play the video. Play the video. Okay, storage. This is a picture of my storage container that fits in the bottom crisper drawer of my fridge. I get things cleaned down and put into paper packets. Um, there's some coin envelopes here. There's different sizes of coin envelopes. I like a uh, number one for small seeds and number six for a large quantity of seed or um, bigger seeds. Uh, Samancia um, jojoba is a large seed and so I put it in a Burger King bag. I have a friend, Connie Beck, who likes to use the return envelopes from junk mail because they are mostly paper. There is a little plastic window, but they can still breathe. Seeds will exchange gases. They, that can be a problem. If they stay wet, it can cause pathogen problems or they can start to sprout. So you wanna get these things cleaned down and dried. Um, you wanna get extra plant material off of them. Uh, stems and leaves and that kind of stuff. It can have bugs in there and uh, it can, it can really make storage a problem. So clean them down. There's usually a point of diminishing returns where you're like, ah, I'll leave a little bit of chaff in there. It's not worth cleaning them any further. And uh, the more you practice doing it, the more you'll get a sense of it. There is a seed and bulb group in the California Native Plant Society. Cindy Hazuka is doing a great job and deals with a lot of different seeds. And so if you are interested in learning how to process seeds, she'd love to have your hands clean those seeds off. It's tedious, but I find it's like a meditation. It's very calming. <laughs> um, I like those jobs that are kind of relax and do it. Can you please repeat that resource for us, Amy? Yeah, it's the California Native Plant Society, the San Diego chapter right. seed and bulb group. And Cindy Hazuka is in charge. So if you go to cnpssd.org, you'll find the seed and bulb group. So this is a Thank you. lot on one slide, but I just wanna give you an idea of what you're looking for in a in propagation environment. You wanna to try to provide sterile conditions. A problem that we have when we provide heat and water, nice growing conditions is that not only seeds are going to grow, we have a lot of pathogens that will take advantage of these conditions and can outgrow the seeds and potentially damage the seeds. Uh, when we, I say soil, but I'm taking a liberty because we're using, we're not gonna go out into our yard and get soil. We're going to use a potting mix, a seed starting mix for this, and it's not going to have soil in it. It's gonna have inorganic things. It's going to have bark and peat. Um, so I'm taking it. I apologize for saying soil. That's not technically what it is, but I mean uh, potting soil or potting mix. We want it to be moist. We don't want it to be dripping wet. We want it to not dry out because these seeds, when they're getting going, drying out for one day can be the end of them. They don't have a lot to them yet. And um, we want the soil to allow air movement. This is one mix. I wouldn't recommend making it. I don't like working with vermiculite. It's got respiratory irritant problems. I would buy a bagged seed starting mix. And then if you want a large amount or you wanna do a co-op with some friends, you can drive up Slaughterhouse Canyon Road to Hanson A1 or whatever the name is now. And you can get a yard of potting soil for under $80. You need somebody with a truck and you need a place to store it. <laughs> it's cheap, it's a lot to deal with, but that's what I, that's what I do to get my soil. Um, bottom heat can help with these metabolic processes to get the seeds going, but they're not, it's not strictly necessary for the large majority of seeds you're going to start. And then you're going to need labels. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about labels a lot because I've uh, had challenges from time to time with not having labeled things. So labels, you can get plastic stick labels. You can, um, we'll talk more about it. Ben Kotnick and Connie Beck love to find an old pair of blinds, an old set of blinds, you know, the ones that you, the slats and just cut those and write on them with pencil, stick them in the pot. 
Challenges include damping off a fungal problem from being wet, from providing those cushy conditions. We can have fungus gnats uh, that like to live in the wet conditions that promote fungus growth, fungal growth or um, algae, algae growth. They can dry out really easily. Sometimes we can deal with dormancy. Uh, we won't go deep into that. Sometimes we don't get much. We plant 100 seeds and we get one. And salts can really be a problem if they're in our water while we're growing seeds. <clears throat> I want to talk about soil. I'm not going to read through this slide. Don't worry. I just want to show you it's got some good pictures of textures and um, some of the things that we'll find in our soilless potting mixes. Peat moss is a big one. It's a non-renewable resource, so sometimes we're moving to core, um, but it is acidic and it holds a lot of water. It can be hard to get wet initially, so a lot of times they'll add um, a surfactant, a wetting agent in there to get the peat wet. Often when you work with soil, you'd like to wet it ahead of time so that it's nice and evenly moist. Perlite's a big one. It provides spaces for air and it will allow water to flow through so that the roots can get it and it'll get it away from the root zone so it doesn't sit and rot there. Vermiculite can be blended into mixes. Um, and then wood, redwood, bark, wood fiber, bulk up and stabilize our mixes so that they don't just disintegrate and they don't compost and end up being just a little thing in the pot. So these are some really good components of a soilless mix and Berger is an excellent Soil mix, pricier than driving up to A1, but if you don't have a truck, it's, it can be a way to go. Your, your local garden store will have lots of options of potting soil and seed starting soil. Um, we wanna sterilize our containers to give ourselves the best chances of success. And you can use household bleach to do this. You don't strictly have to, but you're taking a risk that you're gonna have growth of pathogens and such. So clean off any potting material that might've been left on that plastic and then mix up a fresh batch of one part bleach to nine parts water. Uh, Pat Nolan for Phytophthora, which is a, a pathogen, recommends 30 minutes or more of a soak in this bleach water. You can do a shorter time than that, but for to make sure that you're covered, you can leave them in there. You're gonna to wanna to replace the bleach water pretty regularly, especially if any uh, organic matter gets in there, the bleach will crash quickly and then it'll off gas as well. So if you've got a tub of bleach water sitting out, um, you're gonna to wanna to swap it out pretty regularly if you're bleaching pots. There are a lot of seed treatments that we can use. Heat from fire can help open up some of our conifers and they'll release their seeds. We can use hot water to um, boil some water on the stove, put the seeds in a little container, let the boiling hot water cool down a little bit. Don't put it right on the seeds boiling, but pour it on when it's still quite warm and that can help the seed coat to start to allow water to come in and then the embryo, uh, the, the seed embryo inside will start to swell and break apart that seed coat. <clears throat> we can use smoke, the chemicals from smoke can help things like matilla poppies and other plants uh, seeds to grow. We can use scarification and that's like a, think of it as a scratching with scar. Um, that's a scratching of the seed coat. There's mechanical, you can use sandpaper, you can use you can bigger seeds, you can use clippers, pruners, and clip off a part of that so that the water will enter the seed. You can also use chemical, you can use acids. <laughs> you can follow the, follow the recommendations on that uh, safety data sheet if you use acids to eat at that seed coat to allow the water in. I haven't really worked with them. Um, stratification, sometimes seeds Seeds are waiting for good conditions. They have very little energy in there. And when they start growing, they're, they want their best chance at success. So they're waiting for cues sometimes. They've evolved to have cues that tell them when their best chance at success is. 
And stratification, sticking seeds into the fridge for three months can cue some plants that, hey, you went through a cold period, now you're warm, it's time to start growing. So that some plants really require that, a lot of plants benefit from that. And then um, storing seeds in the fridge is great just because it slows down the metabolism, extends the life of your seeds, extends how, what percentage you'll get when you sow those. This is uh, Mission Manzanita. And we tried some smoke treatment on that with the, with the group at City Farmers. And we had some success with the seedlings and then we didn't water them consistently afterward and lost them. Okay, I'm gonna do a seed sowing demonstration. I'm going to share it straight through YouTube. Um, are you on the seed sowing demonstration on YouTube? Not on Wisteria? Yes. Yes. Excellent, okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna talk you through it. I muted it. There's my seed packet. There's my label. We want a label so that we know what we have. Um, I was going to do this live, but then I got really nervous about the logistics of it and if my neighbors were going to be using power equipment. So this is uh, the top one has more perlite. This is what I'm going to use for my cuttings. The bottom one has a finer texture. It's got smaller particle sizes, and that's what I'm going to use for starting my seeds. <clears throat> I'm shaking the seeds out onto my hand. And you can, you can be very precise about how you put them into, this is a propagation flat. It's got those small holes in the bottom of it. You can use old containers from six packs. Um, you can use any container that holds soil. I like propagation flats. The size works out well for a large scale. So I'm just spreading seeds. I have a lot of these Takati cypress seeds. I'm spreading them over the top of the soil. And then um, because I forgot to grab <laughs> more soil, I'm running out to get more, but the, you, can, you can place seeds very carefully. You can get a count. I, got, I've, I did a hundred seeds because I counted, 15 came up, I've got 15% germination. So I'm just spreading some more soil over the top to cover these. I didn't do any seed treatments. Um, and then one thing that I learned from watching a growing passion, Nan Sturman sowing seeds to help with that damping off, which is because it stays really moist when those, those seedlings start to sprout, you can put perlite, and this is expanded volcanic material that, um, that allows water flow, allows a lot of air to flow through, it's very porous. You can put that over the top to try to help with drying out that sprouting layer and keeping the fungus from establishing there because there's just too much air for it to start to affect the plants. Eh. Amy, okay. I have a question. This is Kim. Yeah. What, what's the difference between perlite and vermiculite and when would you use either one? Perlite is an expanded uh, volcanic material. Vermiculite's an expanded mica. Uh, heat it up really hot. The vermiculite holds a lot of water and it will hang on to that water. Um, it, both of them can be respiratory problems. Uh, they can cause respiratory problems. Perlite, you can wet it down and really uh, keep down how much dust lies in the air when you're using it. Vermiculite seems to be more problematic res for respiratory purposes. So I tend to not use vermiculite because I don't want to expose folks to the potential problems of it. Um, perlite will get wet, but it'll dry out really fast. It'll, it'll allow that water to flow through. So it's, it's creating nice air spaces and it's allowing water to flow through. Vermiculite will hang on to water and make that all. available. Um, those are the general. Okay, back at the PowerPoint. And then it wants to play. I tried embedding them. This is a new thing for me I'm not familiar with. So it didn't quite work out. We're good. So we can see late, What's that? I said, we're good. We can see your PowerPoint. Thank you. 
Excellent. I, I like knowing I'm not just talking about something that's not there. <laughs> um, so you want to label. We're going to start moving into asexual propagation and I'll mostly talk about cuttings, but we want to keep labels with things. When we have the seed packet, we want to label on it. When we put it into the flat, we want to make a label for that flat. If we take those and individually pop them out, we want a label in each pot or a label in the the area where the pots are so that we know what we have. Now these cuttings uh, were taken by the Cuyamaca plant propagation students and I think that this student is a floral design major and made the most beautiful display <laughs> of the cuttings that she had taken but she put a label on each one and when she went out and took the cuttings she didn't necessarily know what all of the plants were. We did a walkthrough she came back and I said, if you don't know any of the plants, take pictures and we'll identify them when we get back. So sometimes you'll make cuttings and you will not know what the name of the plant is. A great resource is uh, San Diego Gardener on Facebook. There's a really great community there that can help identify things that are in San Diego that we commonly grow. Um, try to get an identification with that plant and try to keep the identification with that plant. It makes life easier. So label, when you collect seeds, when you collect cuttings, when you sow your seeds, uh, when you take your cuttings. So sometimes plumeria and epithelums will be written right on the stem of the plant, <laughs> the color of the, the flowers. Um, and then if you move them. So here are some students sticking uh, stem cuttings from woody plants mostly, or uh, semi hardwood plants. Their cutting propagation is really fun, pretty straightforward. We, uh, we get a clone. We get the same genetics by and large from the plant that we're taking the cutting from. There's a few exceptions, but we're getting clones. And so this is great because we can do cultivar. Those are cultivated varieties that, pro that are not likely to come true from seed. Down here is a Salvia Clevelandii Winifred Gilman. It's been selected, it's a cultivated variety that's been selected through horticulture so that it's more compact and well behaved in the garden. It stays supposedly three by three. I think sometimes it gets bigger, but a, a wild Salvia Clevelandii will get to be five feet and really large. Um, if we were to grow this from its seeds, it will have done that sexual selection where we don't exactly know the genetics that we're getting. And a lot of things revert back to where they came from. So it, it would probably start to get bigger. We wanna take cuttings of this if we wanna make sure we have that nice compact form for our garden. Um, we can preserve those desirable features. And sometimes uh, we can get fruits and mature plants much faster. So um, the, the wisteria, if you were to grow them from those seeds, it, would, it could take seven years till it starts to flower is what I've heard. And if you do that wisteria from cuttings or layering, you can get flowers from it within a year or so. So you can get more mature, quicker to fruit plants from cuttings. Drawbacks, if you're doing habitat restoration, you do not want a bunch of clones out there. We've got climate change and we want as many genetics out there to maybe uh, be able to adapt to that as possible if we're restoring native areas. Um, we don't wanna do clones. Timing can be tricky for taking cuttings. Springtime's a great time for a lot of things. Uh, sometimes it requires specialized equipment certain level of skill. I am not gonna take you out and show you this. Oh, will it show it right here? Are you seeing this video right here? Yes. Okay, <laughs> the embed is working. This is a propane torch and I learned this from Ben Kotnick who does a lot of grafting very successfully. He likes to run his, um, his utility blade or his pruners through a propane torch and that will kill things off of the surface of it to keep Mark. it clean. You can use bleach, you can use Lysol, those tend to corrode the metal of your equipment. So uh, becoming a big fan of the propane torch. <laughs> Nodes are 
chances uh, for success when you take stem cuttings. And these nodes, plants have, plant cells have totipotency. So the cell can become any, it can reproduce the entire plant. Not every cell can do that. They tend to go down these pathways and things that are shoot kind of are committed to being shoot. We can do things to bring them back. We can introduce rooting hormones that have auxins that encourage root growth. And when we take cuttings, we're doing damage to this plant tissue. And there are, um, there are responses within the plant that tell it, hey, if you form roots, you might live because you're not attached to the plant, the main plant anymore that has roots. And when I say things like tell them or they want to, I'm anthropomorphizing, um, but they've adapted to the, do these things because it's, it's beneficial. So nodes are these areas where stems and buds come out of the shoot. They have uh, concentrations of hormones that can help them like auxin that can help them form roots. And internodes are these stem pieces that are just between the nodes. So when we take cuttings, we wanna pay attention to where the nodes are. And we'd like to get some nodes between below the soil because some plants will root from those nodes. Some plants will root from the cut base. Uh, it depends, we want the cut base and we want a node or two below the soil if we can. So let's see, if I play this video here, is it big enough to see? We'll go with it because I we're getting close on time. So these are some succulent cuttings that I made. Um, well, I'm making some right now. I'm wondering if I can break them off. I can't break it off. So I get my sterilized pruners out and I cut these. With succulents, they have a lot of um, moisture in the tissues, which makes them very forgiving for propagation because when we're propagating, we're in a race between drying out, rotting, or actually forming the roots that we want. We're walking that fine line. So succulents have the moisture that helps them to not dry out quite as much. We want to prevent them from rotting by allowing that bottom cut edge to dry up a little bit before we stick it in soil. And we call that callusing. Technically it's suberization, but we're just letting that bottom cut end dry off a little bit over a day. Uh, you can go longer, you leave them out for a month, you may come back to roots and leaves. Um, they're very forgiving. <laughs> so I'm just going through and these I propagated a long time ago, just odds and ends. And what's one, that one didn't work out. I let it get too dry. So uh, the one thing that you may notice is missing is labels on that. I got lazy and so I'm gonna have to do, I mostly know what they are. This is Gambelia speciosa. It is a native snapdragon. And I'm showing how kind of less flexible the base is, more flexible the tips are. I've done some cuttings here. This is a, this is a, I've got woody material and I've got semi hardwood and I've got softwood. Hardwood usually takes longer to root. If you use a rooting hormone, you, you probably use a higher concentration and you can change concentrations of uh, the liquid rooting hormones powders and gels, you can't really change the concentration. You can change how much you use. Um, <clears throat> this one's easy though, it doesn't need rooting hormone. I'm cutting that bottom edge at an angle because the leaves on some plants, it's hard to tell which way is up and which way is down. I always like to angle that part that goes in the soil and then I can run through a bunch of cuttings and then sort them and stick them really fast later. This is something you'll get a lot of practice with in my propagation class. Um, you do several flats of cuttings and you get <laughs> pretty efficient with this. Cuttings, drying out is a big issue and leaves are an easy way for these cuttings to dry out. They lose a lot of water through their leaves. So I'm reducing the amount of leaves that are on there. Uh, when I pull the leaves off those nodes that gives them a better chance of converting to forming roots um, rather than doing the shoot that they already are doing. And so here I'm trying to get up to speed that I might propagate at. 
I'm struggling a little bit because I have to do the cuttings over the flat that I'm sticking in them in because of space. And you should not do that. You should do them off to the side so you don't get that stray plant material in your flat. It's just going to rot. <clears throat> um, Good question, Amy. Yeah. Two questions, actually. Okay. Do you have to use rooting hormone to make cuttings? And then also, would you speak specifically to roses? Ooh, I haven't done a lot of roses. <laughs> um, rooting hormone is not necessary for many cuttings. For some, they do better. Some of the um, trees, hardwood trees and uh, things like that, rooting hormone can be very helpful. And there's so many different plants. Um, by and large, I do not use rooting hormone at home. At school, we try uh, different types of rooting hormone and without. So we, we look at some of the different, the same plant under different treatments. Um, I have not done rose cuttings. <laughs> well, actually I've done the native rose cuttings and um, we've found that we've had mixed success with that. We've never tried rooting hormone. So I don't know, does anybody on here have experience with uh, you want to type in the chat what you do for rose cuttings? Do you use rooting hormone? That's a great question. Um, and I don't know. <laughs> so I'm just doing lines here. I think at some point I show that I do have a label. You can cut leaves in half to reduce the amount of surface area that water will get lost through. And um, one thing that I'm doing, I'm pulling some of the stems off of the, the stem that they attach to, and you can get a heel cutting that way. And there's a concentration of, of hormones in that heel cutting. So sometimes I'm leaving that on there if I pull it off another stem. Uh, I admit I'm going through this quickly. There's a lot to this and um, I can't wait till we get and get together in person at City Farmers or at Cuyamaca College. Um, maybe a workshop through Paradise Gardeners when we can meet in person. You got to do this hands-on. So try it out on your own and um, email me. My email's at the end with questions that you have because there's a lot to it. But basically reduce that leaf area, cut at an angle. You can mix up different hardnesses of the wood into one flat. Some will go faster than others. Um, I'm not doing this commercially where I want everything to look the same when I'm done. Me. This is Kim. Am I yeah. seeing both cutting the leaves off as well as just cutting part of the leaf off? Uh huh. Okay. So you're reducing yeah. the leaf area, but using both removing it completely and just cutting half the leaf off. Okay. Got it. Yeah. You don't want any leaves under the soil. They'll just rot. So I'm just stripping those ones off. The ones that are above the soil, those can be useful. And, um, once I do get roots, those can start to photosynthesize and the plant can start growing. So I'm cutting them in half to reduce water loss. You can leave them on there. Uh, if the cutting doesn't like it, sometimes it'll drop all of its leaves. So go back and check on these and get rid of anything that's rotting if, um, if it's dropped in the soil. So let's Thank see. You. Just a few more slides to go. Um, for cuttings, and with the cuttings I used a more porous, I added perlite to the, the mix for the cuttings that I was doing. They don't have roots yet, and so they're not really taking water in through that cut end. Um, you're not interested in getting water to that. You'd like to keep humidity around the top part of the plant while it's doing all those metabolic processes to start root formation. You don't want it to dry out and you don't want it to rot. And that's really a hard thing to, to balance out. But you can cover, you can use chopsticks or things to kind of hold plastic up above your flat or there are some things at different garden centers, little domes that have the clear plastic over the top. They don't need a lot of sun when you're, they don't need a lot of light. They don't need light until they start uh, getting the, that root formation to, to take up water and to do the photosynthesis. Uh, you mostly humid environment. Try to control for any pests. Use sterile soil. Bleach your pots. Use sterilized pruners. And um, 
you don't need really wet soil. So I like half peat, half perlite as a mix to stick things in. It tends to work really well. There's bag propagation mixes and rooting hormones are optional unless you know that the plant is not gonna do anything for you without it. Uh, rotting, drying out. Uh, sometimes you get shoots forming at the top and you're like, yes, I've got it. And then you lift it up and there's nothing down below. It's just using up what it's got in that stem without forming roots. Fungus gnats can be a problem. They can start to knot some of the callus tissue. Callus can form at that bottom cut end and differentiate into roots. Um, sometimes that callus gets really thick and no roots are formed and it's in the way. Um, we don't do annuals this way. We, we do annuals from seed mostly, and uh, we can do some micropropagation with annuals. There are other types of asexual propagation and- uh, as Sorry, must... Amy, we yeah. have some questions coming in before you go on. Uh, yeah. the, the last couple of uh, slides, are you burying several nodes? Great question. I'm trying to bury several nodes. Sometimes they're spaced a little bit far. I'm at least trying to get one down there. Yeah, I wanna get one node down in the dark soil and hope that roots come from it. Sometimes you know that the roots will come from the cut end and not from the node. And then you're not worried as much about it. But if you're kind of getting started and guessing, a node under the soil is a good way to go to, to get some success out of your cuttings. Okay. Question. Where, thank you. Where, where do you place cuttings flat? I think this means where do you place the cuttings flat and water moisture? Recommendation on schedule? <laughs> yeah. Um, if you can get a hold of a mist room that has a uh, really short timed mist that happens regularly, like every half hour or an hour, that's great. Otherwise, um, check on them multiple times a day, keep them in the shade. That'll help with the humidity. You can cover them with plastic. These uh, gambelia that I'm doing, I'm not going to baby them because I know they're really easy. You can even propagate stems with longer nodes into a, a gallon container. Um, it depends on your situation, but don't put them in the sun. Don't, don't, they can have bottom heat. That can be hard to provide. Some of the kits have it. Uh, but shade, check on that moisture regularly. And if, if you can create a little bit of warmth without them getting baked in there, that's great. If there's some humidity, that's good as long as pathogens aren't forming. And I, do you, I don't know that I answered the question. <laughs> do you harden off plants or just succulents? All plants or just succulents? I have a, I have a slide on that. Um, I tend to, and there's an art to hardening things off. Some things are much more forgiving than others, but um, we'll talk about that. Yeah, I'll go into that on the slide. Great and if question. You can maybe, uh, at the end, talk about how to create a mist room if you're just a homeowner on a, <laughs> the line here is a simple homeowner on a budget. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would be a great workshop. And I don't have a mist room at home, um, but remind me, remind me of that one. Let me get through these last few slides and then I'll address the, the hardening off and the creating a mist room. Come Perfect. to City Farmer's Nursery and see how Jim did it. He did a great job. <laughs> um, there are other types of asexual propagation where you get clones. You can do layering, which is like the strawberry plant. I had these runners and I just uh, stuck a flat next to them and put them in the soil so that they would start to form roots. You could cut them off the plant and stick them in soil, they'd still form roots. But layering can be helpful attachment to the parent plant for nutrients and hormones and water, that kind of stuff can help things along. You can do air layering where you take that up to a plant that you can't bend down to the ground and you wrap some, you wound it, put some sphagnum moss in there, get some more sphagnum moss wet, wrap it in a plastic burrito and you can get roots forming up in the air. Um, you can divide plants. That's a really easy way to propagate and get clones. A lot of grasses, you can just do division. Um, grafting is a way to take two different plants that like a Haas avocado. If you wanna grow an avocado from seed, 
maybe you get a Haas, maybe you don't. But if you take a cutting from a Haas avocado and you have a clone and you put it onto something that was grown from seed, which you don't know how that fruit's going to taste, you can graft those two together. And the Rare Fruit Society, I think I said that right, they do a lot of grafting if you're interested in grafting. And then there's tissue culture. You can grow in really sterile environments on an agar medium. And here we have an African violet on the left that was grown on a medium that had more rooting hormone in it. So it started to form roots. On the right is a mass of callus tissue of African violets that's growing on a medium with more cytokinin so that it just makes more and more and more plants. We can divide those and stick them on something and tell them it's time to form roots. Uh, the zoo's doing orchids this way. We, in my plant propagation class, we do all of these hands-on, even tissue culture with varying degrees of success. Contamination is super easy. Um, so hardening off as, as was asked, we often provide a really cushy environment that's got high humidity and low light and it's, we're controlling the temperature. And then we've got our San Diego conditions. So don't move your plants out when there's Santa Ana winds. No, you're gonna wanna uh, protect them and make sure they get a little bit hardened off. These are changes that take place in the, the plant cells where they build up waxy layers. They get used to using water in different ways. They get, they, they change from expecting to have humidity, expecting uh, around the leaves to, hey, there's no humidity. These leaves need to get some changes so that they're not losing water and um, gradual process. So with succulents, it's great. And um, with a lot of plants, when, when they're coming from cushy environments, they're nice and soft. You wanna start to move them slowly into more heat, more sun, till you get them to the conditions that they like. Um, a tomato that's grown in, as a seed in the shade, or not shade, but you know, in a, in a nice moist environment, it wants to be full sun, that tomato, but there's a process to get those plant cells to where they can handle it from the propagating environment to the, the outside conditions. Um, and then Santa Ana's and frost, we wanna protect our plants from these anyway, unless we know that they're like really excited about being in those conditions. I know we're just about at time here. We can keep yeah. going for a few minutes, just so everyone knows. You don't have to hang up right away. We're gonna to try to get in these last couple of questions and last few slides, thanks. Excellent, so just sexual is different from asexual. Uh, there's variety in, in sexual, asexual we control for that variety. Um, these are some of the resources that I like. Hartman and Kester does a, has a plant propagation book that's been around forever and it's wonderful. It goes into a lot of detail. You don't have to go into that much detail. Come join the plant propagation group once we're meeting in person, we'd love to have you. Uh, you can email me, my email will be at the end. Join the seed and bulb team. You can email me and I can get you in touch with Cindy. The OH program at Cuyamaca College has lots of different classes. It'll teach you how to do the irrigation. It'll teach you how to build a mist room. <laughs> It'll teach you how to pour concrete slabs so that you can have your whole propagation environment if you want that. Um, International Plant Propagator Society has a lot of information and they have fun field trips. I've been to Hawaii, I've been to Santa Cruz. I've toured really high end nurseries that uh, stick the cuttings with a robot. It's crazy. And then San Diego Gardener on Facebook is a great way to troubleshoot problems that you're having. Very knowledgeable, very well moderated group. And finally, this is how you can reach uh, Paradise Gardeners. Come join us for more programs. Uh, that's our website, our email. We have a Facebook page, Instagram, and uh, email is probably the best way to get in touch with us and we can route your inquiries and get you where you need to be. We'd love to have you become a member of Paradise Gardeners. It's very inexpensive, I believe $15 for a year. Um, and make any donation it'll help this wonderful project that we're doing where we're putting the plant the native plant garden in where a landfill once was we'd love to have you volunteer and in person once that's okay uh and we'd love to have you tell your friends so thank you so much for coming today really appreciate it and um i don't see my email there my email is a k a h u i e 
at gmail.com. I think it was in the earlier slide that I should have had at the end. And we have it at the chat. Time. We have it in the chat, Amy. We're good. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so mist room building. Um, you're dealing with irrigation. Something, something similar. I mean, can you can you put like a, a plastic bag with a couple of holes in it around a flat or? Yeah, you can do that. Okay. And you can do a small scale irrigation on a clock that comes on automatically. I tend to propagate, I have a bunch of ripsalus around uh, because if I get busy with work and I miss watering, uh, even things that I'm propagating, they stay alive. So I don't have uh, a lot of irrigation on timers, but that's a great way to make sure things get irrigated because when they dry out, it, it can be devastating. The last um, question that I think didn't get answered yet was just talk a little bit about growing roots in water versus placing cutting in peat. You can grow roots in water and um, you can have a lot of success with that. My mom has a Hoya, had a Hoya that she got from a friend in San Diego. She grew it in Utah and then she gave it back to me and I'm growing it in San Diego again. And I think they were all rooted in water. Um, there's really low oxygen in water. And so when you transition from the water to the potting soil, that can dry the roots out really fast. Some of that hardening off is an issue with the, the roots because they're really changing how they, how their environment's changing. And so they're needing to change so that they're not used to having just 100% water, very low oxygen. Um, so you can just watch that watering as you move those roots. You're gonna need to keep things pretty moist down there. Um, and then you can start to scale back until they're on the watering schedule that you use <laughs> for your plants. Um, any other questions, Cam? That's everything else I've seen. Someone asked about a book, but you did mention that on the slide. So, and we will be sending out this um, presentation. We'll, uh, Zalia will be sending out a link so that people can capture this recording elsewhere. I think it's gonna be on the library website, but she'll send that out. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amy. That You're was welcome. awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Destiny and Kim and Nancy. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. For anyone who's in our Paradise Gardens group, the uh, business meeting link was sent to you in an 